Thank you, uh, Chairman. And I haven't uh, very many questions because uh, some of the areas have been covered already. But I have serious concerns, as others, as to what has been proposed here. And I'd like to welcome uh, the witnesses here today. I have also serious concerns about the financial implications here for the landowners. Uh, maybe just the two questions I have. Uh, have ye organisations been consulted on how this will impact on the stakeholders, number one? And uh, has an economic impact assessment been taken here on how much it will uh, basically cost the farmer at the end of the day? Because does the farmer going to suffer here? Maybe the ICSA or the IFE and other organisations might be able to answer them questions. Okay, thank you, Chair. And just to Deputy Collins, is, um, unfortunately, the two answers very, very quickly are no and no. Um, we've had absolutely no consultation from anybody on this and what it's going to look like. Um, and there, as we've said, every, all of the farming organisations have said that we immediately need an impact assessment done. It's because ultimately, at this stage, a lot of us are flying fairly blind. We're dealing with what is big, big legislation come from Europe. We don't know how much our own departments have fully analysed this, but most certainly the impact assessments will need to be carried out because the financial damage that this could possibly do to our rural community and our own farmers is absolutely appalling. Um, so that's really, I suppose, the, the, the most important thing out of that is no and no, unfortunately, and that's something that we would like to get clarified. And just on, I suppose, food security, Deputy Daly, um, look, we, and, and that really was, I suppose, really the question, to, yeah, food, food production. If we've been actively asked to reduce our agricultural production activity on a piece of ground, then obviously that will have an impact on food production. And this is something that we you know, fully really need to analyse here. Ultimately, as an industry, you know, 140,000 farmers are farming and depending on their income from agriculture. And if we're actively asking them to reduce farming activity, no matter what the figure will be, if it's 10,000 farmers, 40,000 farmers, we do not know until this impact assessment is done. If we're asking them to desist agricultural production, then the only financial mechanisms that look to be in place at this particular moment in time are cap funding. And we're asking them to actively devalue their land as a result in order to receive cap funding. Now, that's fundamentally flawed um, in, in, in our view. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Um, as regards consultation, there was a serious deficit as regards consultation um, with, with the various stakeholders, uh, it's our belief. Um, as regards the cost analysis, again, and, and I said it in response to Deputy Carty, um, we need to see an impact assessment uh, in place because, you know, it has a huge impact on the viability, potential viability of a farm for the future generations or maybe for a period of time where there needs to be uh, an income for, for both generations um, in advance of a, a, a transfer. <clears throat> As regards uh, Senator Daly uh, and food security and, and food production, both within Ireland and indeed the EU, um, we saw you know, in, in recent enough times over the last couple of years, initially with COVID uh, and then with the war in the Ukraine, that food security uh, and it was the one thing that went scarce in the shelves in our shops, supermarkets, uh, you know. So it's it is going to have it would have a potentially a huge impact on our ability as as a nation, both as primary producers initially uh, to maintain production or output. We, we, it wouldn't be it wouldn't be possible. And given you know that the, we're facing <clears throat> two barrels uh, as regards nitrates and the nitrates regulations as well, this cannot be taken um, in in single entity. Um, it would impact our, our ability to produce. That would undermine the viability of our processes, whether it is dairy, beef, lamb, uh, etc. But, you know, we have a huge ambition and a huge target and a huge aspiration out there as regards delivering from an environmental perspective as regards planting and forestry. And I don't see, I see this being a complete not a pickpocket uh, of the opportunity to deliver, to deliver forestry plantations. Um, where, where, where it just won't, it just will absolutely cease uh, plenty of land. Um, I don't know whether my colleague John Wright wants to comment on that. No, I'm okay. Okay. John. Colin, similar to what the other firm organisations have said, in terms of being consulted, there's been uh, absolutely no consultation on it and there's been no impact, impact assessment done on it either. Um, or conducted on it in terms of how it will affect 
I suppose the bigger question here in terms of the economic assessment, and it will be carried out to, to, um, on what effect it will have on farmers, but the bigger question from a rural economy point of view is if you take um, you know, the, the land area that's being talked about out of productive capacity, what effect does it have on the wider business circle that supports farming communities? Uh, and that imp impact assessment on your local co-ops, your local uh, garage man, your, your, your local feed merchant, your local vet that we'll be speaking about later, the impact that it's going to have on their businesses as well. Because a figure was mentioned earlier on by Eddie of 871,000 acres having to be re-wetted or there or thereabouts. Um, that's an area about the size of a little bit smaller than the size of Tipperary. Uh, so if you want an impact assessment of the food that's produced out of the county in Tipperary, uh, I think there's a billion euros worth of exports is, goes out of the food production out of the endearing alone out of the county in Tipperary. Uh, so in terms of an impact assessment, it's not very difficult to figure out what, assess, what impact that's going to have um, on the country as a whole. In terms of uh, the impact on food and on forestry, and it's to come back to an earlier question that Deputy Carty referred to as well, um, in terms of objections raised, I think Sweden or, and Finland potentially are the only two countries that have an objection raised to this. Um, because the Swedish have carried out an assessment that it'll, this will impact on 30% of their land area, which is nearly the majority of which their forestry uh, is supplied from. Um, and that's one of the major economic drivers within that country, and naturally at a time of high input prices and when uh, wood-related products are scarce, they're naturally concerned about that. But similarly in Ireland, um, if you're looking at it from a, a food security point of view, we have no definition as to what are the soil types or indication as to what are the soil types that this is going to affect or what areas they're going to be in. Is it going to be tillage? Is it going to be dairying? Uh, is it going to be beef? And what impact that's going to have, not just in the country here, but in terms of international exports. Um, so there is a huge uh, task that needs to be done from the Department of the Environment and also the Department of Agriculture. And just to follow up on a comment that was made in terms of funding, there's many different funding streams being mentioned, and I think there's 12 potential funding streams actually laid out in the document. But the only funding stream that's actually committed to uh, is €100 billion Euros for the implementation of biodiversity measures, uh, which may give you an insight into the foresight and support uh, for the or from the origins of this document for not just the agricultural sector, but indeed for rural economies. If the single line item that refers to funding is dedicated solely for ensuring that biodiversity restoration measures are ensured as opposed to the economic impact it's going to have on landowners. And Liam, I think you just want to have a, a brief comment there as well. Yeah, and to follow on from John again, um, on a food security point of view, we farm in West Clare where there's a large amount of low-lying flat land, including peatland, and as John has alluded to, the, the, the amount of area that may be taken out of farming productivity, but the amount of land that would be affected would be far, far greater. The surrounding lands cannot but be affected by this bill. And that also has to be taken into account. And it's easy enough to multiply a billion euros by whatever you like, really. And the potential, the potential to put farmers out of business here is, is very, very serious, including farmers who do not sign up. Like, so it, this is an extremely serious bill for the impact on rural Ireland and rural populations going forward. Okay. Um, Mr. Ali. Uh, yeah, just uh, firstly, just to take the second point, uh, question there from Paul, and maybe to, to add on, to, I suppose John, John has covered it, everyone else has covered it as regards to food security. Uh, and we do have to, it's not just the food security, obviously, that the wider impact that that's going to have in, in rural Ireland, that that will be quite devastating. And uh, I think we, we need to be very conscious of that. And, and obviously we're here in, in, in the Access Committee on Agriculture, but I think we, you know, we would hope that, uh, most of you are from rural Ireland, but we'd hope other deputies w would recognise that as well. Um, just as regards the consultation, and, and as has been said, that there'd be no consultation with, with us, there's been no, I'm sure, no consultation with farming organisations. What, what is interesting though is, um, if you go to page 9 of the document, they do say there was a public consultation process, uh, that's, that's listed there. Uh, there was an online survey conducted between uh, January and April of 2021, 111,000 replies came in. Uh, interestingly enough, 97% were in favour of uh, more aggressive EU restoration targets. Now, 97% would be somewhere where Vladimir Putin's referendums were in, in Ukraine, so I, I don't know how I don't know how, how 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 much reference we can we can pay on that 97 percent, but I, I think as well when we talk about this, uh, we have to also recognise that the EU biodiversity strategy um, 
you know, which 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 is 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 a massive document uh, as well, and obviously has ma has major implications for us. And, and this will this will 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 hardwire it into to legislation what was being proposed here. But there's been no consultation of that. Uh, now that has been sitting there uh, since May 2020. Uh, we've tried to get engagement. It's been minimal enough. Uh, and I do think, uh, I mean, we have the Citizens Assembly uh, on, on biodiversity loss discussing it at the moment, and that's great. But, but our concern would be that that is the forum we'll be seeing as the consultation. Uh, and, and the people that really do need to have the consultation, you know, are the representative organisations for the farmers who, will, who are in the front line of this. And, and they're the ones that really we need the consultation with. Okay. Mr. Hall. Yeah. Um, thanks, Mr. Chief Chairman. Um, I suppose first thing I want to say is that a lot of our members are very, very upset and very ang angry, actually, about this, pr this proposal. Its generations of work seem to be, don't worry anymore. Some of this land that has been improved, maybe three and four g g generations, and it's, it's good agricultural fertile land now today, that maybe people, their fathers and their grandfathers have worked on this, this land to, Im, to Im improve it. And I think it's shocking that 350, well, 350 thousand hectares will be defined as bad condition in Ireland. The regulation wants to go back 70 years. I mean, how can this be, be achieved without cutting food production and food security? It'll have to be cut back to, 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 this, to this happen. I mean, I see the very alarmed that there has been actually no engagement between the Minister of the Environment and the Minister of Climate and Communications with regard. There has been a bit of a discussion about the biodiversity strategy, but none about this actual uh, regulation of nature restoration. And how can the Minister of the Environment go gung-ho go, go to Europe to support th th this? I would like, for his homework, maybe he study the, the film, The Field, study what boom became, because that is not a fair idea. That is how strong people feel about land, land they have reclaimed and improved over the years. I think that he wants to go and watch, watch that film a few times and realise that this is how strong people, people feel. Furthermore, I see say, it's concerned that government representative groups are totally left out of this access for justice. We have access to, 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 to justice. Where's the access to justice for farmers whose land is going to be taken off them and, and restored, which is really, which is really, really, And should you all be asked whether the government is acting on the best interests of the each checker in agreeing to a clause that will absolutely tie up the state in the legal actions for years to come? They're, they can fund all these NGOs and do these things, but it's going to tie up this government for, for years in lit lit litigation. And I think, especially Article 16, it have to be refused or shut down as it is. I think this all to think needs, we Ireland need to put up a big battle against, against this. When you take, like my colleague there said, you would want to take out the size of temporarily available land and turn, 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 turn it back into, into, into a bog or into bad, bad land. Land that's not being pulled in the last 70 or 80 years, and generations and generations of, 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 of people. And you have people making regulations that haven't, they don't realise the implications of what they're, they're, they're doing. I saw big drains being clawed by, by flagstones, and land being improved, and that land was started being improved by, his, by their, their grandfathers, generations ago. And we had a stock whip, you know, all that, all that work is useless. I mean, people would, can't stand for this. This is going to cause me, me, me. Thanks very much, and I'd like to pass over to my colleague Eddie Punch. He's the technicality is done. 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 What I am. Thanks. Well, well nothing, nothing, nothing extra to say except that Article 16, which says access to justice, specifically says that this is about one side of the debate. The environmental NGOs should be entitled to bring cases against the, the member state if they are not happy with how the member state is implementing it. Now, the member state has to agree a plan, a nature restoration plan with the Commission, which is a complex and drawn out process, as we all know, where presumably there will be already consultation, well, there should be consultation with the stakeholders, but there will inevitably be consultation with environmental groups anyway. But then we have Article 16 that says access to justice is for the environmental NGOs specifically. That's where you are looking at 
a really appalling vista of the state being, and like the state has to make policy eventually, the government has to make policy and it has to implement it. But essentially this Article 16 gives a veto, as it were, to the environmental lobbyists to take action against the government if they are not happy with the plan that the government has put forward and has agreed with the Commission, and then in turn, if they're not happy with how it's being implemented. Like, I, I think there has to be a level of responsibility for government ministers to say that we will not entertain EU regulations that will undermine our ability to govern, that hands over the actual process to a one-sided, legis not legislative, uh, litigious battle, and where the environmental NGOs are given a specific role. What about access to justice for farmers? What about access to justice for landowners? What about our constitutional property rights?